It's like if you have like an emergency preparedness kit or something. Yeah. And like, it's like, oh, I'm not good at first aid. So I'll just throw out all the first aid supplies. If you're not good at something, you still need, you still need to know it. Okay. I'm taking note of this for well, next year for our school. Uh, <laughs> no, no, don't do that. I'm, I have I a mean, record. <laughs> Welcome to Tilled Parenting, a podcast featuring interviews and conversations aimed at inspiring, informing, and supporting parents raising differently wired kids. I'm your host, Debbie Reber, and today I have for you an Asher special episode. For those of you who are newer to the show, when I launched this podcast a little over two years ago, Asher and I recorded episodes every couple of weeks. In fact, we made nearly 20 of these Asher specials to date. And as Asher is growing up and into a teenager, he's very appropriately becoming more private in his thoughts and feelings. So we are cutting back on the episodes that involve Asher. However, we decided to do this one last episode on the topic of education, as we've been having lots of interesting conversations about this ourselves lately, and we thought it might be cool to share them for the podcast. So today we're going to talk about how Asher learns, what he thinks schools get wrong when it comes to supporting atypical learners, and what ideas he has for schools to become more inclusive. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Hey, Asher, how are you? Great. How are you? I'm good, thank you. We haven't done one of these Asher special episodes in a while, and... I wanted to just have a conversation with you. We've been having a lot of discussions about education, the state of education, what your education looks like, changes we're making, all those kinds of things. And so I thought we'd just have a conversation rather than a specific Q&A or anything like that, because I think your thoughts about education are interesting as someone who was in the system and now is being homeschooled and you're learning kind of in an alternative way. Does that sound okay with you? Yeah, that sounds great. So we are wrapping up the end of seventh grade here. I'm just curious how you think school's been this year. It's been great. Yeah, we've been, we've done kind of a, kind of a mishmash of online classes. We had your dad step in as a teacher this year. You and I did some things together. You had some teachers coming in from outside. So tell me about the online classes that you've done. And you don't have to go into the details for each one, but I'm just curious what that format has been like for you, taking the virtual live classes? It's been pretty good. It's kind of bothersome because they all happen at night. For you, they do because of the time zone difference? Yeah. So has that been hard to have school during the day and then have a little time off and then have to get back on a call? Yeah. Yeah, I totally understand that. That's hard. We're actually trying to make a change for next year so that the classes we've chosen, I was really careful so that they were earlier in the day. Like, I think 5 p.m. is your latest class, because you had one class that was at 8 p.m. this year, and I think that was probably too late. Yeah. I'm just curious what the interaction has been like. Have you enjoyed getting to connect with other kids? Like, do you feel like that is real classroom conversation that's happening, whether it's over the microphone or in the chat rooms? I mean, not really, because I have the, because there's not the same kids. There are none of the same kids in each class, so I feel like I only know them through that class. Through that one class. Yeah. And now that it's over, I'll never communicate with them again. Oh. Well, maybe you will. You're doing a project with one of your teachers with another student. You guys will probably be in touch for a long time, I have a feeling. Okay, I suppose that's top secret. Okay, it's top secret. We won't discuss that. No problem. Well, one of the things that we've been talking about, because you're going into eighth grade and then high school will be on the horizon. And we're just trying to think about what's working, what isn't working, what we might want to do different. So we have been having conversations about the state of education in general. And I'm just kind of curious to know some of your thoughts around education kind of in general. Like, what do you think are some of the problems with the traditional educational model? I don't know. I'd say the biggest problems are that. Great. I forgot what I was going to say. It's okay. Take a minute. Do you want me to restate the question? No, I remember what you said. Still thinking I got one of them. I, okay. So I'd say the biggest two problems are that the traditional school system assumes that 
everyone learns the same way and at the same pace. And it's the best possible approach that you can take if everyone learned the same way and at the same pace. All right. But they don't. Do you think most kids do? Yeah, I would say light majority of kids the system works well for. Was that your experience when you were in school? I know that was a long time ago now. Yeah. So why doesn't that work, in your opinion, for different kinds of learners? Well, say you're, say you're better than the other people your age, the specific subject, right? You'll be, you're, slow, you'll, you're slowed down by your classmates. Because you're forced to learn the same things that they know and at the same slow pace, even though, even if you're much better at that subject than they are. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and that's just talking about knowledge, but what even about like an aptitude? Well, yeah, and people who learn in different ways, right? Exactly. Like an approach that works for most people might not work for some people. Mm -hmm. How do you think you learn? the best? Like, what do you think is your best method for gaining knowledge? I have no idea. Well, one of the things, this is just an observation. As your parent and homeschool teacher, you are someone who can read something and that, you know, some people read things for pleasure. Some people read things and they might get little bits and pieces out of it. When you read something, you're really good I at it. the gist of something. Well, yeah, you get the gist of it, but you also are able to kind of file it away and use that new information and apply it in other areas of your life or make connections between that information and other information you already have stored. So reading is actually... I'm more like intuitive, you know, like I played, I played Kerbal Space Program for a while, right? I know all about orbital physics, but I don't know any of the actual equations. It just makes sense to me now that going that way would make you go up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the other way that you actually learn, we, we were talking about this the other day, because one of your favorite things to do while you're having a lunch break is to watch videos from, would you want to share some of your favorite YouTube channels that you watch? Uh, well, the best are CGP Gray. And what is that? Can you explain that? Um, that's just some guy who does videos on random things. Yeah, <laughs> that doesn't sound very compelling. No, but it is. It's great. Yeah, I would just, for listeners, I always say it wrong. It's not CGP Gray. CPG Gray, is that right? It's CGP Gray. Oh, I said it right the first time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. You become so convinced that you're wrong that you start saying it right, but then you say it, but then you correct yourself to saying it wrong. Yeah. Okay. So CGP Gray, that is an awesome YouTube channel where this guy whose who's true identity is, is hidden, right? Yeah, it's unknown. We don't know who he is. But he does these videos. They're anywhere from like maybe three to six minutes in length average. Is that right? The longest one on record is 20. Okay. But the average three to four minutes. They're not that long. And he does a lot of geopolitical videos. Give some examples of some of the videos he does. I don't know. He, did, he does a lot on geography and terminology, like the difference between Holland and the Netherlands and the United Kingdom and Britain and all the, yeah, he'll, he explains terms that people use and Scandinavia. And a lot of things on the electoral systems of different countries. Yeah, and and voting systems. Yeah. Well, no, only one of them is actually, only one of the ones he explains is actually used by a country. The rest are all just theoretical. And then another great one is Kurzgesagt. Mm -hmm. A-U-R-Z-G-E-S-A-G-T. Yeah. They're a German group of animators who do science videos with birds. <laughs> that also sounds kind of strange, but they're really awesome. They're like 10 minutes long and they do a new one once Lately, a month, I they've think. they getting into weirder and weirder stuff, but they started out with simple things. What was the most recent one that was weird? I don't know. They had something about like black hole decay, something astrophysics. Okay. But their first videos are about more mundane things like banking and... And history and... Yeah. The history of the universe and things like that. But now they've run out of easy things to do videos on, so they're just doing 
astrophysics. Yeah, I can't really follow those if I'm being honest. But um, so those two and anything else that you're watching a lot of? You watch TED Ed video videos sometimes. Yeah, Crash Course is great. Oh yeah, we watch a lot of Crash Course here for sure. If listeners aren't familiar with that, they you know whether your kid's being homeschooled or they're not, they have a ton of series on all kinds of subjects from economics to statistics to U.S. history, world history, religion, physics, chemistry. What am I missing? Media literacy, mythology, really everything. Yeah. So I would say, Ash, that that is one way that you learn as well. And that is, I think I used to feel guilty about you watching a couple of videos over lunch when, you know, maybe you should be reading or maybe you should be doing something else. But I've noticed that that is, you are actually learning from all of that. That's one of the ways that you learn and you, you're you truly learning and it's helping you think about things that lead into really good discussions together, critical thinking and other stuff. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Well, I guess Alex agrees too. He had better... <laughs> yeah, so I would say that's one way that you learn reading and watching things. I also think that another way that you learn, Asher, is just through discussion. Yeah, although it's kind of hard to get in discussion. So I normally just tell other people about things and ask for their opinions. Well, but if we're doing like we're studying U.S. history right now, we have some pretty interesting, you know, I'm re we're reading the book, The People's History of the United States, and that brings up always sparks some area of interest. And then it leads us down a bit of a rabbit hole sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's also a good way. So one of the things, Ash, I've had a lot of guests on who cater to differently wired learners and are trying to think about the education system and how to fix it. I'm just wondering if you have any ideas about that, because it's kind of like the big unsolved problem. I'd say probably the biggest thing you could do is to group people by skill rather than age, because, right? What And what if they have uh, different skill levels and different subjects? What would that look like? Yeah, that would look like you'd go to the advanced class in this subject, but the not so advanced class in this other subject. The classes would all be sorted by skill levels rather than grades, right? Because there is like a, because right now there's like a sixth grade math class, seventh grade math class, eighth grade math class. With this, there'd be like a pretty good math class, a really good math class, and an excellent math class or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And depending on your skill, you'd be in one of those. We'll be right back after this quick break. Maybe I've watched too many seasons of The Amazing Race, but every time I have to go somewhere on the subway, I treat it like a competition. It's all about making the right gut decisions about which route will get me there the fastest. Sometimes those decisions get me where I'm going early, and other times my gambles don't really pay off. Probiotics can't help with most gut decisions, but if your gut needs a little support, Ritual has your back. Their Symbiotic Plus, a three-in-one supplement, has clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. I've been using Symbiotic Plus for about six months now, and it's become a core part of my morning routine. I take the mini capsule every morning while making my way through my inbox, whether I'm at home or I'm on the road, because it doesn't need to be refrigerated. And the capsule itself is delayed released, which helps it survive the harsh conditions of the upper GI tract for delivery to the colon. And that's exactly where we want it to go. Ritual invested in a study modeling the human colon, which showed that Symbiotic Plus significantly increased microbial diversity and the growth of beneficial bacteria. There's no more shame in your gut game. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. Get 25% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash tilt. Start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash tilt for 25% off. During this month of planning and organization for big transitions, rhythms and routines have been absolutely essential for our physical and emotional well-being. So Green Chef nights are reliably and predictably a good night. We know the ingredients will be fresh and prepped, the instructions easy to follow, and the meal delicious. We're all still talking about last week's turkey tacos with mango chimichurri sauce, refried beans, and Monterey Jack cheese. 
Green Chef contributes to a healthy lifestyle with easy and delicious menus like fresh seasonal salads and green bowls. And with over 80 weekly meal and market options, plus rotating options to suit a variety of lifestyles, whether Mediterranean, plant-based, calorie smart, keto, protein packed, gluten-free, there are always plenty of options to choose from. Whatever you select, you'll get farm fresh ingredients, organic whole fruits and veggies, and premium proteins all delivered straight to your door. I love those four words, straight to my door. Oh, and one more thing I love about Green Chef, they have an app, which means it's easy to manage meal preferences and delivery from your phone if you want to. And I, for one, want to. I am in that mode where I'm making the most of little moments like waiting in line at the pharmacy or for the F train to pull into the station to tackle all of those to-dos. So the convenience of an app is key for me. Green Chef has a special offer for Tilt listeners. Go to greenchef.com slash Tilt50 and use code Tilt50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's 50% off plus 20% off your next two months when you use the code Tilt50 at greenchef.com slash Tilt50. But what if you're, I'm just curious, like... And everyone has. I won't have to complete the expert class of each subject to graduate. Okay. So you might start off a year and you're really good at this one subject and you learn it right away and then you don't have to, for example. Everyone would learn at their own pace rather than aging at their own pace. I have a feeling some schools do something similar to that. What do you think about actually different ways of learning, right? you know, addressing that problem. So you're talking about kids at different levels and making sure that they are learning at a level for where they're at, whether that's above level or below level, whatever that those yeah. concepts mean. But you know, in terms of if we have this a bell curve, yeah, a bell curve. But what about kids who their actual learning process is different? Like we were just talking about you're someone who learns a lot through reading and through videos and other things like that. There are some kids who learn in a very tactile way and they actually need to be doing things with their hands. How do we address, I'm just curious if you can solve this problem for all of us. Maybe they could just try, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, maybe they could mix up the methods, right? Worst case scenario, you could just have different, you could just find a you could just make categories of learning methods and have a different class for each method mm-hmm. or maybe different schools for each method. What the heck? Right. And that, that exists as well, right? There are some schools that are, do kind of individualized, fully individualized learning. So each student is learning on their own level, their own pace and in the way that they learn. I would say the problem right now. Yeah. I would say people need to be sorted into into categories based on how they learn and how they're learning and put in a class with people in the same category Mm -hmm. and a teacher who's trained to teach to that category. Right. Because right now it's essentially, okay, so we group people by how old they are and then we teach them skills based on how much we think they should know about that subject by how old they are. Mm -hmm. Like, no, that doesn't make any sense. It's basically, it's a school for the average human. The school system right now is school for the average human. And we need school for every human. Totally agree. So if you think about these different alternative ways of learning, and if kids, you know, are learning in a way that maybe is different than the typical learner, do you think that that's fine that they kind of make their way through school learning in the way that they learn and then move on? Or do you think it's important that they eventually learn these more traditional methods of consuming information? I don't know. I think, yeah, I don't, I think it's not the, it's more the, the core idea of traditional school isn't wrong. It's like, it's the, it's more the implementation, you know? Like the idea is we get people who we get people who learn the same way in a classroom where they're all taught that way. Right? You teach as many people as you can the stuff that they need to know. Yeah. If you were to design your ideal school for you individually as a learner, what would it be like? It would be like what I just described, probably. You'd be in a class, you'd be in a group of people who learned 
the same way as you and who are the same level as you. Would your ideal school still have all the kind of same subjects that a traditional school has? Or do you feel? Yeah, it would, because I do believe that there are that you do need to know a lot of the stuff in traditional school. You do need to know. Why? Because it's useful later in life, right? It's like if you have like an emergency preparedness kit or something. Yeah. And like, it's like, oh, I'm not good at first aid. So I'll just throw out all the first aid supplies. If you're not good at something, you still need, you still need to know it. Okay. I'm taking note of this for next year for our school. Uh. No, no, don't do that. I have a record. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think your ideas, I totally agree with. And I think the challenge is that there are a number of schools, you know, especially in the US and I know in other countries that are trying different approaches, democratic schools and individualized learning and schools that are very um, project based where the teachers are really only there to guide the students in developing their own ideas. So there are lots of different models. But the challenge is that those schools are almost exclusively private schools. And so therefore, there's a barrier to entry, an economic barrier to entry, a geographic. Well, barrier to entry is an economic term. So okay, it's when you can't, it's when it's really hard to enter a market as a new company, right? Like you might want to make a new You might want to start a new tech company that makes the best phones ever, but you can't. It's ridiculously hard to start your own tech company and compete with Apple and Google because Apple and Google have such a ridiculously large market share that because that's the meaning of a barrier to entry in economics. Mm -hmm. It costs a ridiculous amount of money to be able to enter this market. Right. So I guess I'm saying it's the same idea with that. Private schools, because of the very nature of them being private and there being a fee associated with having your child enrolled, and also these schools are not located everywhere where people live. They tend to be in urban areas. And so the majority of students, of which we already know more than 20% are differently wired, don't have access to those kinds of programs. I'm just wondering, do you have any ideas for what schools, traditional public schools could do to better accommodate or support differently wired learners? Well, what I just said, I mean, the easiest thing to do would be to group people by skill level rather than age. Maybe at the start of every year, after the first, you take a te- you take a test that determines what classes you'll be put in. Do you think there's a way of doing that, though? A lot of schools do separate out, especially for subjects like math. They do exactly what you're talking about. I mean, that was happening when I was in back in the day when I was a student, you know, starting middle school, we were grouped into our level um, in math and some other subjects. So that happens. But the problem I have with that is that, A, it, it values cognitive ability based on this one marker of how you perform on this test. And B, it also separates kids into quote unquote, the smart kids and the not so smart kids on a very basic level. That's how it could be perceived. What do you think about those comments? I don't know. I suppose so. But there are always people who are better at any particular thing and always people who are worse. It's inescapable, right? Do you think there are ways to accommodate in a public school system the system that exists today? I mean, even in the even in the current system where they rank people by age, there are still people who get bad grades and people who get A pluses. It wouldn't be any worse, you know. Do you think within the current system there is room for figuring out a way to accommodate different types of learners? So not teaching everyone the exact same way or Well, I mean the the worst case scenario would be that you just have different Ideally, you'd be able to separate people into different into a small number of different categories that could encompass an equal amount of people. Mm-hmm. So you'd still have the same infrastructure. Yeah, and you'd still have, and there wouldn't be like, yeah, that every group would have the same support. There wouldn't like be a big group of normal people and then the four other groups of weirdos. 
to prevent, it's making the cracks smaller so people don't fall through the cracks. Mm. Yeah, that's the analogy. It's making the cracks smaller. We'll be right back after this quick break. Hey there, it's Debbie. I love making this show and sharing conversations about how to support our awesome neurodivergent kids. I've seen how even one little insight from an interview can spark a big shift in daily life. But I know that raising complex kids can be messy and lonely. And just when we think we figured it out, something comes up that boots us right back to feeling overwhelmed and stuck. That's why I've poured everything into creating a way for parents like us navigating complex parenting journeys to join together and chart a path that feels positive, hopeful, and doable. It's the brand new Differently Wired Club experience. In the club, you'll get personal support from me and other seasoned parent coaches, six live calls every month where you can connect and get your personal questions answered, the opportunity to learn directly from authors and experts like I have on this show, monthly themes for getting specific and tactical, an exclusive private podcast feed, and the best, most generous community of parents. Seriously, these folks show up for themselves and each other, and that right there is really everything. Because it's a daily reminder that we're not alone. Our kids aren't broken, and we have totally got this. The recently rebooted Differently Wired Club is on a brand new platform with its very own iOS and Android app. It is such a great space. However you learn, whatever your style, no matter the ages, genders, and neurodivergent profile of your children, the Differently Wired Club can help you cultivate the positive shifts you're hoping for. Join us today by going to tiltparenting.com slash club. That's tiltparenting.com slash club. I hope to see you on the inside. If you're a parent, I invite you to join us at the Mindful Mama podcast, where it's all about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. With sometimes hilarious and always thought-provoking experts and friends, at Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm Hunter Clark Fields, and I can't wait to see you there. Listen in to the Mindful Mama podcast. Do you think that schools should be able to, or should work towards finding a way to support kids who move through the world differently in terms of, you know, just, I always go back to your example that you've brought up in many episodes about being someone who moves a lot or fidgets a lot. Like, do you think that there's a way that public school, the traditional school system could could allow kids to kind of learn the way they learn and move the way they need to move while still working for all students? Yeah, I mean, they could have things to fidget with that wouldn't be loud and distracting to other people would probably be easy. Yeah, they could have like school issued pens that didn't make clicking sounds, for example, like this. Yeah, that's a pen clicking. <laughs> exactly. And I would say, yeah, I would say work on making fidgeting, for example, less distracting to other people. What about getting up and moving around in class? Like some some people, like you, for example, you think best when you're moving around, when you're walking around. You think that should be allowed? Yeah, maybe. Maybe there could be. Yeah, I don't like the idea of like assigned seats either. Like there might be a few tables on the outside of the class for people to write, for example. But yeah, more of a standing up thing, for example. You know, with just a few tables around, with just some tables and chairs around the edges, but a big open space in the middle. Yeah, I like that idea. And at the same time, I recognize there are some kids who need structure and who really want... Exactly. So they could sit at the desks. Just there'd be the proportional amount of desks as there are people who prefer desks. Interesting. Rather than desks for everyone, if you don't like them too bad, there'll be desks for everyone who needs desks plus a few extras. Right. Yeah, I think a lot of conventions of the traditional educational system just need to be teased apart, you know, just kind of really look at absolutely everything. Like, Yeah, because right now the, the school system is set up for the average person. Yeah, and I would argue that it's not even ideal for the average person. It's such a outdated model in many ways. And uh, yeah, I mean, the original idea of the school system was thought up in Victorian times, more than 100 years ago. And it hasn't been changed since, except they got rid of six. 
They got rid of what? Sticks. As a uh, corporal punishment tools? Yeah. Oh, that's a good thing. Yeah, but that's it. I think there may have been a few other changes, but it's still the same overall model. And I think there is a lot of room to explore. What could we question? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? But is there a different way? So that's going to be the tilt parenting phase two, changing the education system for differently wired kids everywhere. Well, not just for differently wired kids, for everyone. Yeah, that's true. Good point. Because again, I would really not like to. It would be bad if any of the categories were significantly larger than the others. Ideally, you'd have like a, here, I'll draw something. But then again, you can't really show it, can you? Dang. No, you can draw, draw it and I'll take a picture of it. Okay, but like imagine a chart and like... There you go. So maybe group people into so so there are here, here are people who have more of yeah who learn better this way here are people who learn better this way who learn worse that way who learn worse that way and you'd put people on this chart by and they'd fit into one of these areas. Mm-hmm. I mean it's not perfect like someone someone who's up here way in the upper left corner might get grouped with someone who's right here or someone here might be grouped with someone there. But it's definitely much better than the current system, which is just one box. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. One is too, one is too few categories to sort people into. Yeah. <laughs> one really isn't a category, is it? It is. It's a category of, yeah, and right now it's just normal people. Normal people and everyone else. <laughs> 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 well, I want to thank you for chatting with me about this stuff. We get lots of requests to do conversations and someone I was talking with a few weeks ago said, what about just an Asher and Debbie unplugged where you just talk about, just have a conversation. So that's what I wanted to try today. And super interesting, just stuff to think about. I wish we had all the answers for how to fix the education system, but I think it's worth continuing to explore and question what could be. And I want to keep hearing your ideas about it too, because I think you're in such a great position to consider this because because you are one of the students being impacted by the current system. Yeah. I mean, then again, this this system wouldn't be perfect still because you would still have the outliers, the people at the very edges, but mm-hmm. there are always going to be edges and you can't sort people in. The only, the best possible system would be you'd have a category for every person on earth. That would be the best possible system. But Yeah. That's really not possible because then you would need a teacher for every person on earth separately. Yeah. So the best you can do is group them into the most categories that won't seriously inconvenience everyone. Yeah. Be interesting to think about what that magic number is. Yeah. It's def- I'd say it's definitely less than 10 and more. It's less than 10 and more than one. Mm-hmm. Generally, that's a good number to go for. Um, okay. Well, again, I want to just thank you for the conversation today. It's a Sunday morning here. Beautiful Sunday morning in Amsterdam. We just got in from a walk and I know you have a lot of things on your personal to-do list that you want to get to. So, Oh, I certainly do. I will, uh, I will let you go. So thanks so much for the conversation today, Asher. You're welcome. You've been listening to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. For the show notes for this episode, including links to all the resources Asher and I discussed, visit tiltparenting.com slash 110. If you like what we're doing at the Tilt Parenting Podcast and you want to support us, there are a few easy and meaningful ways you can do this. One is to join my Patreon campaign. Patreon is an online platform that allows people to make a small monthly contribution to support the work of an artist or a musician, or in my case, a podcaster. And it's super easy to sign up and even a small monthly donation helps. $2 a month makes a difference. If you'd like to support the show, visit patreon.com slash tilt parenting, or you can find a link on tilt parenting website. The other way you can help is to go to iTunes and leave us a rating or a review or both if you haven't done so already. There are a lot of parenting podcasts out there and the ratings and reviews really help to keep our podcast visible. 
And that makes it easier for me when I send out email requests for new guests to talk about how popular this show is. So thank you so much. And thanks again for listening. For more information on Till Parenting, visit www.tillparenting.com. Are you overwhelmed by the things that get in the way of you doing what you want to do? Are you looking for ways to simplify life to better align with your values? Do you want to create space in your schedule so you have room for more of the good stuff? Play, joy, relationships, gratitude, and more? If you answered yes to any of these questions, I invite you to check out Edit Your Life, a podcast to help you edit the unnecessary from your life so you have more room to enjoy the awesome. Through episodes with me, Christine Co., and a range of super smart, compassionate, and thoughtful guests, you'll come away with big picture insights and practical ways to declutter your home, schedule, and mental space without getting bogged down by perfection. I have always believed that small moments and actions matter tremendously. My goal is to help you find agency and space in your life through doable baby steps that will leave you feeling accomplished instead of overwhelmed. Check out Edit Your Life wherever you enjoy your podcasts.